Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Twende Mbele webinar on monitoring and evaluation in Uganda. Uh, my name is Radhika Menon. I lead the Evidence Use Hub in Oxford Policy Management. Uh, it's my privilege to be moderating a very interesting webinar today. Um, as you all know, Uganda has made rapid strides in strengthening monitoring and evaluation in the country. In the last 15 years in particular, we've seen policy reforms um, being undertaken, strategies being developed, mechani mechanisms being put in place to institutionalize monitoring and evaluation. Um, and it's been great to see this boom, particularly in the last 15 years. Um, and today's webinar gives us a chance to do some stock taking, to share some of the achievements um, and also to think about some of the challenges faced. Um, it's an opportunity for all of us to learn together and also think about what can be done to sustain the momentum that we've seen in Uganda. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping rules before we start off. Um, we'd encourage everyone to keep themselves muted so that we don't have too much of um, background noise. This webinar is being recorded and the rec recording will be made available on um, all of the relevant partner websites. So we just want to avoid the noise. Um, it'd be great if you could also switch off video. Um, we're just trying to preserve internet bandwidth here. Um, and, you know, there will be a chance to have a Q&A. So we have a running order of presentations and there'll be a chance to have Q&A. So we'll encourage you to unmute yourself and ask a question. But we'll also encourage you to just put in questions in the chat as the presentations are happening. Um, post also comments and I'll do my best as a moderator to make sure all of these comments and questions come into the discussion that follows. Um, so do feel free to use the, the chat function as we go along, that'd be very helpful. Um, so in terms of the, the running order for today, we will have a, a, an opening address. Um, and as I understand, um, we have someone who will be making the opening remarks on behalf of the acting permanent secretary from the Office of the Prime Minister, Mr. James Collins Dombo. Allow me on behalf of the Acting Power Secretary, Mr. Dombo, yes, give opening remarks. Uh, he's uh, going to attend to other official duties. However, he takes seriously the, the importance of this workshop, this webinar. So he sends you greetings. So I will go to his statement. Uh, Your Excellencies and Honorable Ministers, Director Generals and Permanent Secretary is present. Development partners, representatives of governments and international organizations, the academia and the civil society, others, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to address you at this occasion when the office of the Prime Minister, in conjunction with Trend and Bell Initiative and the Center for Learning and Evaluation and Results is hosting the 2021 Uganda Monitoring and Evaluation Day. Although we have hosted several similar events in Uganda over the years, this is the first time we are hosting the event in this format, not just for Uganda, but also in other 20 and sister countries of Benin, South Africa, Ghana, Niger, Kenya, and the rest of the countries in the continent. In Uganda, we have just embarked on the implementation of the National Development Plan 3. The plan introduces several policy reforms and requires us to institute new mechanisms to strengthen the implementation of the plan. I hope the hosting of this event in Uganda and our sister countries, is also, which are doing the same, will mobilize and energize national actors on the continent to intensify their commitment and engage the decisions we make globally, but also continues to prevent, cope with, and manage the impact of the pandemic is a primary focus of government. Gains and security in the future is being pursued vigorously with strict requirements to intensively engage all arms of government, mobilize and energize every single actor motivate the public and private sector and closely watch the performance of every sector to deliver to the desired levels. The success of government 
is measured by its possible choices and what it delivers. In the process of managing public policy, there are two critical constituencies that are so important that we must not forget to involve. Uh, that's the parliament, which is the legislative arm, and the citizens themselves. I hope we'll scale up our plans of evolving these two in pursuit of the objective of using evidence to improve development outcomes. For countries to make meaningful strides in development, there is need for knowledge on what works and what does not work. We also know that there is a shortage of information on the effectiveness of government actions, which is significantly limiting measurement of the cost and part of services being delivered to the citizens. For example, we are currently facing challenges with accessing data for targeting vulnerable persons to be supported with the cash transfer to help them cope with the lockdown situation. It's for this reason that Uganda will embrace more evidence-based evaluations for policy making to ensure that government program this going forward so that we improve on learning from what we do. Therefore, the mountain and evaluation day is of particular importance for all of us practitioners to share knowledge and respond to the increasing demand for better services. I therefore hope that this webinar will be dedicated to discussing and deliberating on constructive matters that have a strong and positive bearing on our priorities and objectives. In conclusion, I wish to commend the partners, including Twende Mbede and the Evaluation Association, the Economic Policy Research Center, and SEDI, as well as the International Resource Facilitators, for their invaluable contribution to the event and the Directorate of M and E for organizing this event. I think an evaluation day open and wish you fruitful deliberations. I thank you for God and my country. Thank you, over to you, convener. Thank you so much, Mr. Kaima. Thank you so much. Thank you for those uh, words. Um, I think the opening remarks have really set the context uh, for the discussion we're going to have today. And um, many of the themes that have been highlighted will be picked up in the discussion today. So thank you very much uh, for those words. Okay, so we have a great um, set of speakers today. Um, and each of them is a champion for evidence-informed decision-making in their own right. Um, and it's quite a diverse set of speakers that we have. Each of them represents an organization or an entity that has really contributed in strengthening um, m and &E in, in Uganda. So the, in terms of the running order, we have uh, Timothy Lubanga, who is the, who's already spoken, <laughs> um, who's a familiar face, I'm sure uh, he's Commissioner MME, um, but more at the central government level from the Office of the Prime Minister, who will start off. Then we'll have Mr. Gonzaga Mayanja, who will, who's also a Commissioner MME, but will give a local government perspective. He's from the Office of the Prime Minister again. And then we'll have a slightly different perspective, uh, more of an external non government perspective, but a very interesting perspective. Uh, from Dr. Medina Guloba, who's a senior research fellow at um, the Economic Policy Research Center, a leading think tank in Uganda. Um, and then we have uh, uh, Josephine Watera, again, another familiar face, Assistant Director m and &E in the Parliament of Uganda. Uh, and then finally, to round it off, um, we have um, an association that someone from an association who is that has been doing a lot of work in Uganda, the Uganda Evaluation Association. So we have the president, Mr. Matthew Lobulwa, who will be making presentation. So we'll have all of these presentations. Um, each presenter will about, have about 10 minutes to present. Um, and then we're really hoping to have a you know, good 25 minutes for discussion. So um, speakers should stick to their time limit of 10 minutes. And um, I, I know you'll be using technology with Zoom, but I'm going to use a very, <laughs> the most traditional bell possible to ring at uh, eight minutes, one bell, and then two minutes, 10 minutes, two bells. Yeah. So then the speakers also have an idea um, about the time. 
Um, so Timothy, I'm handing over to you to make our presentation. Thank you, uh, Radhika. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening again, uh, participants. Um, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to share with you uh, today. And um, I look forward to a fruitful discussion. Wow. Okay, so the presentation has um, uh, five parts and uh, I will be quite uh, quick. Um, uh, give a little background, highlight a few achievements, and then uh, talk about the M&D influence and some drawbacks uh, that we have experienced here in Uganda, and then efforts to take uh, forward our M&E work. So uh, again, to begin with, so the monitoring and evaluation um, agenda or system in Uganda is um, backed by a legal uh, and constitutional uh, provision, uh, but we also have several uh, policy provisions. We have a number of laws uh, that, in addition to the constitution, provide for how M&A should be done in Uganda, including the Public Finance and uh, Management uh, and Accountability Act. Um, and uh, we also have a number of strategies. We have uh, 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 developed over the years different M&E strategies. We also developed a policy in 2013, and all those um, provide our legal and policy uh, framework upon which we have built the national M&E system. Uh, but it broadly, it covers uh, assessment on progress at outcome and output level, financial pro performance, uh, implementation of key government projects, what we call core government projects, uh, progress on uh, specific commitments on the ruling party's manifesto. Uh, we have a special component to deal with the sustainable development goals. And then we have a whole framework for doing evaluations, which I will share later. Next slide. So that diagram uh, just summarizes for you the way the framework is developed. And in just one minute, I want just to highlight at the top, you can see the presidency, cabinet, and parliament. So at the end of the day, everything we do flows into cabinet uh, and then to the presidency, but also ends up in parliament. At the next level is where you have uh, office of the prime minister at the center because of the uh, mechanisms for coordinating all the elements. Then we have a national planning authority uh, on, on one angle and office of the president in another angle. And then below that is a role that covers uh, all the other actors, development partners, all the government agencies, including local government level. We have a special focus on what the Minister of Finance does because of um, the budget monitoring and the Bureau of Statistics uh, on the right there because of the surveys and censuses and the data, which is important for uh, M&E. &E. And of course, we all this is cascaded also at the local government level. Next slide. So in the presentation today, um, if you look at the program, uh, the intention really is to, uh, to share some of the areas where we have been able to achieve much and some of the challenges and how we have been able to use that to improve what we do. So um, in terms of the, the achievement, I think our big, biggest achievement has been on the outcome of the performance reports that we produce annually and also half annually. And this is a performance report that we do for every government sector for every government department and for every government agency. And um, I will explain a little later, but we have, uh, I think, scored quite highly, especially in the recent years, the last two years, in terms of the amount of policy and program programs that are informed by our analysis in those performance reports. I thought that's the number one achievement that we would like to share. And also, the amount of cabinet decisions we have been able to influence. Because if we are able to influence decisions at cabinet level, 
then we are really able to create impact uh, in the government business. And then my colleague, Mr. Mahenja, will highlight how we are also influencing budget allocations uh, from the local government assessment. But we also uh, are now experiencing a lot of demand uh, from our partners uh, to use our results to inf inform their own programming. We have other successes in terms of capacity development where we have worked with uh, many national and international agencies, uh, Uganda universities, but also institutions like Twendembele, 3IE, um, the, uh, CLIA, the EU, the World Bank, GIZ, um, uh, FCDO, and many, many other institutions and partners. And then uh, we have also been able to transform from a paper-based manual M&D system to uh, going online in terms of the mechanisms for receiving reports uh, and doing our M&E. Uh, so, so I think our biggest lesson, as I said, is around incorporation of the recommendations of our performance assessment into the plans and budgets um, uh, that come in the subsequent financial years. This is key because at the end of the day, the majority of the government funding really goes to funding new development interventions every year. And the extent to which we are able to learn from our poor performance, from uh, challenges and constraints in uh, implementation in the previous year to influence planning in subsequent years, um, is, is, is goes a long way in saving resources, in reducing duplication, and in uh, decreasing um, wastage. And for us, that is one area where we, we, we think that we have recorded tremendous progress, especially in the last two years. But we have also been able to increase demand uh, for evidence uh, driven by a strong political will. So what we are seeing now is we are seeing more demands from parliament asking for programs and projects to be evaluated. We are seeing more directives from cabinet, but we are also seeing more demands from the citizens and from the academia, from the media. If you read um, uh, the national dailies here, you will see demands from citizens asking for, show us the value of this program. Of what value has this investment been? This program is not well designed. We need to understand if it is succeeding and so on. So we're seeing an increase in demand and this is something for which we are really, really happy about, but we need to scale up, scale up build on that demand to actually um, be able to respond to the citizens with the information that is required. We are also working on a culture for evidence use. Uh, uh, and this is also an area where we are seeing some significant progress. We are working with the study, uh, the moderator, uh, if she introduced herself, uh, is a member of a consortium uh, of a program called Strengthening Evidence for this Development Impact, uh, funded by the UK government, uh, and also with Twende Bele and a number of other partners. And this is really an area where we want to inculcate a culture of performance review, of using evidence, um, of generating more evidence and making value of it to improve the way we do things. Uh, and then we are also uh, seeing as a result, uh, more government-wide engagement. So previously, five, six years ago, we would see 40, 60% of the departments submitting reports on time. Now, when a circular is issued, we are getting more response, more interest. Uh, previously, we would get demands for training from a few interested sectors and stakeholders here and there. Now we are getting many, many programs and sectors coming to us and saying, we want you to come and support us develop our M&D plan. We want you to come and train our staff on um, uh, the use of GIS uh, technology for M&E uh, and so on and so on. So that engagement has gone wide across, uh, across government. And then um, we are seeing more collaboration with the parliament, with the civil society, and with other uh, key coordination institutions in government. Parliament particularly is a, is, is a very important one because of its role in 
supervising and challenging uh, the executive to do better. And so this enhanced collaboration in, is very important. Again, five years down ago, uh, we would get questions in parliament like, have you ever evaluated any program? What was the use of, what was the result of that evaluation? But now uh, uh, we are getting demands like, submit to us evaluation reports um, for the projects that you evaluated last year. And summarize for us what these reports have caused. So we are realizing also uh, that, that level of um, uh, achievement. Next slide. Uh, so we have uh, other achievements that I will not dwell on in terms of developing uh, operational plans, uh, integrated uh, systems, and a government evaluation facility. The government evaluation facility particularly is of, significant, of significance to us because we have been able to commission 48 policy and program evaluations over the years. In the last two years alone, we have been able to do nine, nine policy and program evaluations. Um, and those evaluations uh, have, in varying, in varying degrees, have been able to influence changes in program development and also in how uh, future programs are being designed. Next slide. Um, as I conclude, I can see my 10 minutes is almost done. Next slide, uh, okay. So, so there are a few drawbacks in this, in this experience that I thought uh, would be of interest. Number one is data quality. Uh, and Mr. Kaima, when he was reading and uh, presenting the opening remarks, he highlighted this. He said, the country now in Uganda, we are grappling with data to help target a cash transfer program, which is being provided to persons uh, who have lost their jobs because of the lockdown brought about by the COVID-19 COVID, uh, COVID pandemic. So we have um, here categories of people like uh, Okada or Boda Boda riders, uh, saloon owners, uh, people who earn on a, day, on a daily basis and survive on those incomes on a daily basis. And it's just a nightmare. We don't have the data to target them across the country. Um, and, and that is a major issue uh, also for our M&E. Then there are issues around capacity for reporting and generation of data, uh, limited automation across government, especially administrative data. There's very little automation of that. The sensors and high level data, yes, that is fairly automated, uh, but really in the modern era, we cannot uh, continue to do business that way. And then overall inadequate resources, shortage of uh, staff, working on M&E across the sectors, but also resources invested on policy and program evaluations. Um, that slide presents our M&E influence path, which I will not present. I'll go to the next slide as I wrap up. So in a nutshell, uh, what I have presented uh, is partly covered on the left hand part uh, including under monitoring and under evaluations. But uh, on the right, which is the last column, is just what I want to uh, share with colleagues. And that is our future outlook. So one, building on our lessons one, we would like to develop a national m and strategy for NDP3, taking into consideration all our history and what we have been able to gain and learn. So we have to develop a new strategy um, in light of that experience. Two is to roll out an online uh, web-based public sector integrated m and system. Just yesterday, we were briefing the, our new ministers. We have a new government in Uganda about the system. And the, the idea is to roll this out so that everybody now going forward is able to, refer, to report and access data online. And we reduce uh, on paper wastage. And then reviewing the national m and &E policy. Uh, we, our policy is now about eight or so years old. And the lifespan for a policy here in Uganda is 10 years. So uh, we need to review that. And then we also intend to do a robust evaluation agenda for the National Development Plan 3. Uh, and uh, 
introduce a cluster-based assessment for ministerial performance. So what we want to do now is every, every month, every minister, uh, every month is allocated to a set of ministers who, have, who come and make a presentation to the prime minister. And that is an accountability presentation where we present your uh, assessment performance and you are able to uh, have a discussion with the prime minister on how you're going to address uh, the areas where performance is low. And then intensify on uh, following up uh, implementation of our recommendations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Radhika, I would like to stop there. The rest of the slides are uh, a detail of that, but that is um, um, the message that I wanted to share in terms of uh, some of the key areas where we have been able to do well and uh, our plans going forward. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Lubanga. I think, um, I'm sure we can pick up some of these things in the discussion. Um, encouraging everyone to post questions in the, in the chat or comments in the chat um, as the presentations are happening. And so with that, I'd like to call on Mr. Gonzaga Mayanja to make his presentation, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know whether my video can be seen. Yes, we can see you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, actually, uh, my presentation outline, next slide. We have uh, the introduction. I will discuss the m and initiatives in local government. I raised the achievements in the last two years. I will discuss lessons learned. And lastly, I look at the implication of lessons learned future work. Next slide. Uh, as an introduction, I've made reference to the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda and the Local Government Act, which gives a wider range of mandate for services to be delivered to citizens. And of course, these include human capital, financial, etc., to make sure that local governments achieve what they are mandated to do. Government impact of the reform to enable local governments effectively deliver services to the citizens by ensuring improved staffing levels, enhanced local revenue generation capacities, inspection and monitoring and enhancement of accountability to citizens. And a number of initiatives are therefore in place to ensure effective monitoring and evaluation of government programs and the projects in local governments, basically by strengthening central government by strengthening central government oversight and the support, uh, building capacity of local government in the management of services, and also, sorry, so, someone entered the system and, and blocked my uh, slides. Service delivery performance at the facility level, like in schools and health facilities. Now, among the M and E initiatives in local government, you're saying that since 2009, government came up with initiatives and reforms to monitor and evaluate local governments, which are coordinated by Office of the Prime Minister. Among those initiatives, we have number one, the annual local government performance assessment. This is done on an annual basis, and it covers all local governments. Government or Office of the Prime Minister engages consultants who undertake the performance assessment for all the local governments in the country, higher local governments, that's districts and the municipalities. The second initiative is the Parazas, and these are community accountability platforms, and they've been conducted in the country since 2009, and so far almost 1,000 sub-counties have been covered, and there are so many issues and lessons learned out of that. 
of course the the the, the last one is on basically on on quarterly monitoring uh, visits and development partner uh, missions these are done on a quarterly basis and basically it's here to enable that the issues which are raised in the quarterly report are addressed immediately and this helps to facilitate timely implementation of key projects especially within the education health and water sector next slide now the achievements which you have uh, which you have uh, uh, got in the past two years under the annual government performance assessment we have registered improvement in the average performance of local governments in terms of systems processes and the service delivery which has improved from 56 percent in 2017-18 financial year to 68 percent in financial year 19 20. Two, following the development and implementation of the performance improvement plans by Minister of Local Government, some local governments tremendously improved their performance. Uh, members, what we need to know here is that after Office of the Prime Minister has done the assessment and highlighted the weak areas, Minister of Local Government prepares performance improvement plans to address the weak areas identified during the assessment. And of course, with the implementation of performance improvement uh, plans, we have seen local governments that were previously performing poorly being moved to the forefront. We gave an example of Bugiri District, which is in Eastern Uganda, that was ranked 91 in financial 2017-18. Again, it was also ranked 18 in financial year 18-19. However, because of the performance improvement, it is now ranked second in the, uh, the last performance assessment of 2019-20. And then more resources have been advanced to local governments based on their performance. And the local government performance assessment results impact on the percentage of the development grant allocated to each local government. This has been an achievement within the allocation criteria of uh, uh, development grants to local government. Performance improvement takes 50%, or it contributes 50% of the development grant allocation formula to local governments. So if a local government performs well in education or health, because of that indicator, it gets a slight increase, the resources allocated to it under that arrangement. For the Barazas, we have seen good, uh, we have, they have fostered good governance through transparency and open accountability. And in this case, Uganda's corruption index has reduced from 150 before the Barazas began in 2009 to 27 in 2020. And the number of development policy reviews have been influenced through Baraza Brothers, that's including redesigning of the public sector organization. Barazas have enhanced public program ownership in the beneficiary local governments. Also, Barazas have gradually, they gradually mitigate the gap that was being faced in the popularization and mainstreaming of SDGs in the local government. Through the Barazas arrangement, SDG issues are also discussed and members make a comment and it also helps them to understand better how we are moving. Now, the quarterly monitoring visits, these have been conducted on a quarterly basis in the frontline service delivery sectors of health, education, water, and agriculture. Actually, agriculture is a new addition because the previous three sectors were handled under the new reform which we are talking about. And the quarterly monitoring visits, they help to track 
program on development of a number of infrastructure projects, such as city schools and even upgrade of health centers, which are being done uh, by upgrading health centers to health center to health center theories. Next slide. On what has worked. Now, under the annual government performance assessment, we use independent firms to undertake the performance assessment. This has worked and it brings out the aspect of independence. Because if an independent firm does the assessment, there is a high degree of reliance on the results that have come out of the assessment. However, Office of the Prime Minister through the assessment task force also do spot checks to validate what the independent firms are also doing on the ground. Like for example, if the independent firm has proposed someone to undertake financial management assessment, we have to ensure that the person who is in the proposal is the real person who is doing the work and those are the spot checks which we talk about. Then there is also the use of the assessment results. I've already talked about it, where the results are being used by Ministry of Finance to allocate the development grants for health education water and also to help in the performance improvement plans by Ministry of Local Government. Of course, we have revised the framework and we have included in more new indicators. More like, for example, we have included micro scale irrigation in order to make sure that the assessment is more comprehensive. On Barazas, we have also found out that there are very high interest and demand for Barazas and a passionate participation from the communities and all the stakeholders. We have had partners who have come on board because of the good results from the Barazas in as far as community accountability is concerned. Right now, we have support from the Development Initiative for Northern Uganda. This is basically an EU uh, program that is helping us to do more barazas in Northern Uganda, so that the communities receive accountability for the resources that have been given to the local governments. Um, quarterly monitoring, sorry, quarterly monitoring events. We have had uh, a work accelerated timely and uh, this timely implementation of projects in local government. That one is a big achievement. Now, the next slide looks at what did it work well. Now, on the annual local government performance assessment, we have had issues because of COVID. The money which we use for assessment usually is shared by the local government for internalization so that they prepare quite in time. This has not been properly done and we feel this is an area where we can do better. There's also inadequate provision of support to local governments by line ministries. Of recent, there are minimal movements to local government and therefore the support has not been adequate per se. Then there is also inadequate preparation by some local governments because of COVID, some officers are usually on, some are off, so you find that the preparations are also a bit lacking. On Barazas, there is inadequate follow-up with the Barazas actions and the recommendation. There are so many recommendations that are picked from the Barazas, but we are still having a challenge of following up all the issues to make sure that they are concluded. Still again, on the quarterly monitoring visits, there are still restrictions on movement from one place to another to offer support because of the restrictions. But we hope once COVID is overcome, all these shortcomings will be properly addressed. Now, in terms of implications of lessons learned for future work, 
Of course, still, we are looking at the issues of uh, inadequate resources, that's the inadequate budget, to undertake the assessment, to conduct the barazas, and also to properly disseminate the results and even follow up on the actions. Another issue is still on um, time reprochurement. Of course, you know, we use independent farms to do the assessment, but because of challenges in procurement, sometimes the procurements are not done on time and usually we get delays in starting on the assessment. There are issues with the timely dissemination and the orientation of local governments on the manual for better preparations. And also, Lady Ministries should provide timely support and guidance to local governments to enhance their performance. Then local governments should be supported to recruit the critical staff, especially heads of department, since some fail to attract, to attract staff. Then there are also issues with the partnerships, which we have noted, working with the development partners like Twende, World Bank, 3IG, supplements government effort in terms of uh, reaching out to the communities to ensure that what has been proper, uh, planned is properly done. A moderator, as I wind up, I gave some few, uh, uh, just pictures to give you a true reflection of how a buzzer looks like. You see people gathered in the tent, some are seated on the sides, listening for accountability from the, uh, the, 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 the local government officials. The last slide is on, it's a question and answer session that indicates how people line up, ready to pose the questions to the civil servants and the political leaders to justify their actions. Thank you very much. That's what we had to share for, uh, with you in as far as monitoring and evaluation for local government is concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it was great to have the local government perspectives. Um, we will take a question and answer later or put them in later. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we, we move on to our next presentation. So may I call on Dr. Medina Gupta, the Senior Research Fellow at the PRC um, University of Center. Um, good, uh, good afternoon, Radhika and everyone listening, all your capacities. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, when I was uh, when I told to participate in, uh, sorry, I'm not going to put on the video, it might actually slow down the whole net. So I said it to, to put it down. So allow me that indulgence. Uh, so when I was given this to speak to, I said, what can we really bring on board as EPRC on this M&E webinar today? So in this case, I'll be speaking on how does research fit into this, this story. Um, and I will follow through that then how the achievements within the brief sense, some of the lessons we've seen, and how that has the impact of M&E been in this arena. And the rest will be around the floor, uh, reactions or comments, discussion, and to add their input to the whole discussion. Yes, next. So what has been our role in this space of monitoring and evaluation? Um, you see, in this case, EPRC, its mandate is mainly to provide... Uh, someone missing me? Interruptions? Sorry, Medina, I think someone had uh, unmuted. I've muted them. Okay, thank you. So as I was saying, EPRC main role in this area as a, re a think tank that has been around for over 20 years is to provide evidence-based uh, research that's aiming to guide policy implementation processes for both government partners, both uh, external and internal, beyond government. So in this area where we come in with my friends from Prime Minister's office, said it, we got APRC seats on the evaluation subcommittee uh, that is chaired with that's sitting within the Prime Minister's office and also belong to the National Working Group on Monitoring and Evaluation. And uh, as an institution, we are representing the research and academia uh, in this arena uh, of, of um, the, the committees. So we do provide the technical input to some of the other works that have been done from our, with our partners, 
such as those are funded either through the EU that are actually being done by other colleagues from Macquarie University, other consultants. So we do provide this kind of uh, the chain of research in terms of technical capacity and input for rigor uh, in terms of what is going on or being evaluated. So we, as an institution, we do also work with the various ministries and departments to evaluate also the ongoing researches or the already concluded programs, as you'll see. So in this regard, one of the issues which I've just touched on uh, on the last bit, uh, when we uh, as an institution worked with the Prime Minister's office, when the minister, the, the PS, the Prime Minister at that time, uh, Honorable Ndugu, had, was wondering why poverty reversals and when government has put in so much uh, into, this, uh, into these issues around reduction of poverty without going back to the institution. So as an institution, we're tasked to do this, and uh, we supported the, minister, the Prime Minister's office in evaluating the assessment programs around livelihood, of which this was a process evaluation. I'm giving an example of some of these. Um, uh, the figure there gives an example of some of the, the programs that were evaluated. And uh, I must say, government had over 325 livelihood-related inter, uh, interventions that were ongoing. So you can see the kind of work that uh, the department uh, of uh, monitoring evaluation has on its uh, table to do a lot of evaluations on there. So EPRC did on this to represent, give a picture of what is ongoing. And there are really interesting results in there, which of course is not today's um, point of discussion. So the other achievement, so we do, on the issues around the technical input, yes, it's okay first five to go to the next one, next slide. For on the technical input, uh, we as an institution also do provide some bit of big support in the, Nash, the Northern Uganda Social Action Fund. Uh, this is being supported by the World Bank. So there are several um, uh, projects or programs that are being implemented through NUSAF. The issues around the watersheds, issues around the, the DRF, that's the Development Relief Fund or ref, for the refugees. We have the DINO itself. Uh, which not, didn't separate, but we have other on, on issues around disaster preparedness. So some of these reports that come in through the NUSAF Technical Committee as an institution, it has been a, a big achievement to provide input into the success and programming and implementation of the NUSAF 3. So we see also another achievement coming through one of the projects that we do support called the INCLUDE project on creating productive and decent work for youth and women, where through the collaborations we've been having through M and E, we were holding barrazas. As everyone can imagine, Corona presented uh, challenges in uh, times of doing hardcore research, to, in terms of acceptability, in terms of uh, reaching out to persons. So you find that the barrazas that the former uh, speaker has actually talked about, Mayanja, really are also a bit effective in trying to do accountability for for the value for money and what's going around with the citizens' voices. So in that, one of the things we've also learned is the around aspects of stakeholder mapping to understand your environment in terms of who's influencing what for action. And the other bit has been also, which uh, Radhik is good is there, is uh, us partnering with SEDI in terms of strengthening the evidence development for impact in here at the country level has been a bit interesting when we find that you need to map and understand who are your influencers. So, sorry, let's go back a bit. Uh -huh. So, on the issue around study, the works in here have been, you know, an eye opener in terms of um, who do you influence? Who should you partner with to work? Where should your work go for action? So, that's one of the things that study actually does. You'd think you know your environment well until you have encountered or worked with what SEDI uh, actually calls for. So it is a really important pathway of trying to see how best uh, you can influence your evidence for the higher level in terms of uptake. So that has been a, a very good um, experience uh, in terms of uh, seeing how best we can actually take our work for uptake apps. So what have we learned in the process? that engagement processes uh, actually do differ and engagement really matters. And in this case, timing is very essential. So right now, as, as the previous speakers have talked, we are in the NDP world. 
So what are we going to do to make sure we are relevant to the NDP3? So the timing of evaluation towards the NDP3 implementation processes is very critical. So also the other bit we learned in the process is the programming design actually also do matter for evidence, especially within the evaluation world. So if you really want to convince your people you've marked out there as the influencers and high techs, high stakes, then your designs really will matter in this case for, for you to be taken seriously. So also it was very critical to understand our operating environment. Now recall, it was sometimes you see either elections here, not elections here, new manifestos going on. So what should you do in this scenario? How should you strategize yourself to have what you packed around to go in? So I would rather think that, is it critical to, to, to see how best your work also fits into the current manifestos as M and E? What are we going to do also for the manifesto of the ruling government to actually evaluate it? in terms of the environment for it to be impactful. So the other bit we also learned in the process was, once you actually establish trust, especially among government people, okay, and you strengthen these relations over time, this is one of the key ways of having work going on and being listened to um, as an authority in the M&E arena. So it is very critical in this, in this area that as the M and E department or its partners, we are on board. We need to establish the, the quality of the work we bring out that is not actually, uh, what should I say, sieved uh, in terms of the evidence we are bringing on. We give it as it is, and then the moment we are taken seriously, and then it is those issues of relations that are actually going to be key in ongoing relations with government. As OPM, how do you relate with other ministries or other MDS? when probably trust is, is low. So the other, other aspect on this issue has been, when we see evidence use is seen more as a reporting avenue, you know, carrot and stick. If you sit within the national working group of M&E, it's sometimes they feel like some, it's a carrot and stick, I'm just reporting what I'm going to do and that's it. And uh, I think we need to go beyond this to see what the critical actions that are being, uh, what need to be done such that that we need to invest in the what is the so what, especially as M and E uh, fraternity. What is it so, so what after generating this evidence? As OPM, do you take the initiative to see it being um, actionalized, at least within the government spaces? So how do we engage with these decision makers to ensure that the uptake is done? Uh, when so we had the PLE, I think uh, evaluation done. When the results came out, what happened? So what was the issue around it? the YLP. So as an M&E department, I think they need to move beyond process evaluations. I think there have been very many. I'm, I know uh, Timothy will agree with me. Every single uh, proposal we have on board is a process evaluation. Uh, but we need a bit of rigor. But at, again, that's because it's coming from the, some of the deficits we're having, the program designs we have uh, already in place. You find you come on board to evaluate a program when it's already ongoing. So how will you be in terms of rigor, in terms of implementing or evaluating these processes that actually are not very well informed within the designs uh, when, when they are going to implement them or execute them? So actually enforcing an evaluation becomes a lot a bit difficult to do attribution of the impacts of, uh, of these programs. So what has uh, we, as the impact of OPM's department, in my perception, has been around the biggest bit, the convening power, as we can see even today, in convening the, 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 the environment around m and &E in Uganda and beyond. So that we do commend uh, the department or the, the director of m and &E. And also one, the other bit on their impact has been at least conducting uh, evaluation government programs that actually inform uh, government itself, even if they are process evaluations. The only issue we have to say is do they listen? Uh, in terms of when uh, these evaluations have gone and what can we track those actions that have come out from these evaluations. And um, lastly, one of the things again we noticed the way uh, the, the department of the directorate is recognition and leveraging on the roles 
and the strength of its partners like EPRC here today to contribute its mandate in terms of evidence without when there's no capacity within the department, at least they do leverage on this kind of, uh, of environments out there beyond M&E itself. So we do see that kind of impact uh, from M&E. And I think uh, the role of research is really, really taken seriously within the, the department and the directorate of uh, monitoring and evaluation within the office of the prime minister. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me conclude to that as our experience within our 10 minutes because of time, we can always engage within the platform and within the chat room. Thank you so much, Radhika, back to you. Thank you so much, Marina. That was that was great. Um, so, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to push along um, and ask uh, Josephine Matera to make a presentation. Um, she will be bringing her perspectives from the point of view of the Parliament. She's the Assistant Director, Monitoring and Evaluation. There, Josephine. Thank you very much, uh, Randika. And I want to thank all my colleagues for that pace that has been set, and especially where Madina has just transited us. And uh, I'm not going to take long, um, like uh, Randika has said, I'm just bringing the general perspective of uh, evaluation from the side of parliament. And uh, parliament, uh, of course, is a forum for articulation. Um, this is where public opinions are easily brought. And so evaluation really has an input. And we see that uh, at international level, there are a lot of pressures and calls that are being put uh, on parliament to ensure that um, evidence uh, or evaluation is making its way for betterment of service delivery. And we can see this from the police declaration, which emphasizes aspects of results. The Accra Agenda of Action 2008, the Busan Declaration, and now the SDG, and specifically SDG 16, that calls upon uh, accountable institutions and parliament has uh, a big role to play here. But also locally, our constitution stipulates um, specific responsibilities and, dis and designates functions uh, of parliament to, to scrutinize government policy and administration. And so the functions of monitoring and evaluation are core and key in the activities of parliament. And these uh, are stipulated in four areas, uh, the aspects of representation, that we cannot have voices of the people represented in the house without knowing what exactly the people are talking about. And that's why partnerships with people like EPRC is very, very key. Um, the aspects of oversight, holding the executive to account. Uh, we need to pick lessons from the field. We need to pick lessons from real uh, data and information to be able to influence uh, what change we want to see through the oversight function. And in passing our legislation, informing how the government or the whole country should be directed. We also need uh, in evaluation to inform this and also in terms of allocating resources, we need to rationalize and prioritize effectively, but we can only do this when we have um, evaluation that is informing this process. So in terms of what is the mandate um, of parliament in the evaluation scenario, uh, we see that parliament facilitates um, uh, demand, but also accelerates supply. So um, my first uh, spoke speaker this um, afternoon, we are in Uganda, so we'll say afternoon, uh, uh, Timothy talked about the demands that we have been putting on different evaluations. So from the side of parliament, we have the mandate or the powers to initiate or commission evaluations. And this can be done through direct requisition uh, from parliament to MDS and also specifically OPM or from our research departments number two for conducting independent evaluations. So for example, we've mentioned the youth livelihood program, the YLP, uh, there are evaluations that were conducted uh, or requested for by parliament to, to be undertaken by office of the prime minister, but also the research department has undertaken a process of evaluation independently so that we also have evidence from the other side of the table. And these have been informed uh, changes that we see today uh, of this program through the committee on gender, uh, but also disseminating our own and other evaluation findings. So we work together and uh, we have what we call the evaluation week um, I mean the Parliament um, uh, week and also the research um, the research week and these are avenues for for disseminating evaluations that have already been undertaken uh, within Parliament but also to escalate what others have done and submitted in Parliament. Through these evaluations, we are able to make policy changes um, by using the findings that are available at hand. 
and I've given an example of the Youth Livelihood Program, the Uganda Women Empowerment uh, Program. We have also made changes on it because uh, there was concern that the, the process for accessing these resources was so rigorous, the paperwork was so much detailed, and so the members of the community who could not access these funds because of those uh, systematic issues. And uh, because of the evaluation findings that have come from these uh, studies, we've been able to recommend, and these recommendations have been effected. Also in keeping the MDs accountable by demanding evaluations from them on specific programs, and also adhering to ensuring that uh, we are adhering to the evaluation policy guidelines and standards. And here, um, annually, the, the parliament receives a report from the National Planning Authority, the report on the implementation of the National Development Plan. So just to ensure that the guidelines and standards that have been set for different uh, programs are being uh, specifically followed. Next. So, um, in the national uh, monitoring and evaluation policy, we have this specific section uh, 6.1.3 that delineates three key responsibilities for parliament in relation to evaluations. And uh, specifically to scrutinize various objects of expenditure, and this is the um, appropriation function that I earlier mentioned, to ensure accountability and transparency, which is oversight, but also to monitor the implementation of government programs. So these are the key areas that have been clearly uh, uh, highlighted in the national M&D policy. And so when, when parliament is delivering, we are guided by this, so we are together in this fight. Next. So in terms of, um, uh, like I earlier mentioned, our national evaluation system, we've been at the forefront to demand high quality evaluations from departments so that uh, we are not implementing things blindly. And one of the uh, examples I can give you is that every time a bill is brought in parliament, it's supposed to be accompanied by a study um, to show that there was no any other way we could arrive at uh, or, or solve this matter without this legislation in, 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 in place. So we require that we have um, an evaluation kind of to inform the need for a specific uh, legislation but also leading evaluation efforts um, uh, in, in specific areas. But also very important, something that I think Parliament of Uganda has really been commended by other parliaments are aspects of self-assessment. That we're not just looking at what others are doing out there, but also we're looking at ourselves. And we have been in the field, especially now that the 10th parliament has closed, we've been in the field, we've done a citizen scorecard and got views of the public on what they think about how the 10th parliament performed. So for us, we think it's also a way of strengthening the institution, using evaluation for purposes of internal reflections. So these three areas uh, interact and reinforce each other, and at the end of the day, help us to uh, spear ahead and, and, and take forward the national evaluation system. Let's move. So in terms of structures, um, the structure that we have, existing structure, so we have the internal production units for our evaluation, like I mentioned earlier. We have the parliamentary research service that does the independent assessments of different programs and evaluations. Um, they have done evaluation, for example, on creation of new cities, on use of polythene bags, on post legislative scrutiny, on the um, gender uh, certificate of gender equity. Uh, they have looked at domestic violence. Uh, when we passed the law in 2010, how far we implemented this law, the female genital manipulation um, uh, genital, uh, female genital uh, uh, manipulation uh, act to see what extent we have been able to to also deal with this matter uh, after the law that had been enacted. So all these are avenues through which we get the internal production for evaluation within parliament, the parliamentary budget office and the tax aspects of the finance side, to what extent the budget has been effectively implemented. And then we have the monitoring and evaluation unit where, um, where we do knowledge brokering with civil society organizations to work with committees of parliament to advance uh, evidence. But we also work with external pro pro production uh, units. Uh, we mentioned the, the OPM Office of the Prime Minister, the Government Evaluation Facility, and also other stakeholders like academia and civil society organizations. So what are the lessons which we have learned? Within parliament, we have challenges in, certain, in terms of time. Um, we have a, a lot of uh, things that are usually happening concurrently. And so following through the evaluation cycle, sometimes the challenge that by the time we set out, we've sent, 
say OPM, go and do for us this evaluation, another thing comes up and, 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 and then we find our members moving to another item. So it's an institution that is moving so fast and so the evaluation uh, processes need to be speedy and, 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 and fast to be able to inform evidence. Uh, but also aspects of proper alignment of evaluation to parliamentary calendars. Sometimes if evidence is brought to us, but it's brought late when it is outside the schedule uh, for specific um, work that parliament is considering at that time. But also we realize the importance of collaborations uh, because when we collaborate, then we're able to get much more from outside. Difficulty in agreeing on areas of, of divergency. Uh, so we've had these uh, different studies that have ban been done on YLP and have been difficulties. Sometimes others are saying, let's add the money, others are saying, let's first reduce. So even when evidence is on the table, sometimes you have divergence in terms of interest. And then uh, um, the increasing role uh, of, of, the, of the parliament to, because of the evolving expectations of citizens, the need for data, if you don't use in good in evidence, then sit, uh, social media is coming to influence uh, what should be uh, discussed in the house. And of course, issues of resources. Uh, we've had the budget line that we said we, we have put in place, but every time we want to put money there, there are other factors. So we still see challenges in terms of allocations. So thank you very much. Uh, I will stop here for now. And thank you very much once again, members, for logging in and for this discussion. Thank you so much. And uh, sorry, Josephine, if that was a bit rushed for you at the end. But yeah, let's hope we have just even a few minutes at the end for some discussion. Um, so just going to push along. I'm going to ask Mr. Matthew Lugulwa to make his presentation, please. Well, oh, thank you so much, Radhika, uh, for the moderation this evening, this afternoon, this morning, and this night for some of the people who are participating in this session. Uh, my name is Matthew Ruhura, and I'm the president of Uganda Evaluation Association. Um, the outline of my presentation, I'll talk about the Uganda Evaluation Association, then I'll speak about the situation analysis, the partnership with Office of the Prime Minister in professionalizing M&E, other contributions by the association, achievements, bottlenecks, lessons learned, and then way forward. Um, in terms of situation analysis, in 1990s, there were few evaluations undertaken in Uganda, mostly donor initiated and funded, as well as implemented. And the findings were primarily used for accountability purposes. There was inadequate knowledge and skills among practitioners uh, poor quality products, uh, challenges of ethics and integrity. There was an absence of a professional network and evaluation was not recognized as a respectable profession. Um, about Uganda Evaluation Association, uh, the association was established in 2002 as a national chapter of the African Evaluation Association and it was incorporated as a company limited by a guarantee in 2014. Our mission is to promote the practice, use, uh, quality, and ethics of m and &E. And the objectives, uh, many they include building the capacity of evaluators, uh, building the national network, promote professionalism, initiate and inter-exchange schemes for regional and international exchanges, support global networking and collaboration, foster links between civil society organizations, government, academia, and private sector, and that includes Office of the Prime Minister. Uh, the Uganda Evaluation Association is governed by a democratically elected executive committee, which has nine members. And the term of office runs for two years. Uh, on aggregate, membership for both paid and unpaid up members has grown from 160 members in 2010 to about 1,200 members this year. Um, Next slide. Yeah, the membership growth is shown in this chart. You see in 2003, 43 members of which 15 were paid up, uh, going to 2010, 160 and about eight were paid up. And coming to last year, um, 720 were still active, of which 124 were paid up. Of course, these payments were slowed down last year by the pandemic, uh, which was also limiting the activities. 
We also have another category of the young and emerging evaluator. There are two categories of membership, young and emerging evaluators, and then the ordinary membership. In terms of partnerships with the Office of the Prime Minister in professionalizing M&E, uh, the objective of the partnership is to promote M&E practice and use of evidence. And OPM and Uganda Evaluation Association execute joint M&E activities in this partnership. They include the Annie Evaluation Week, development and popularizing the Uganda Evaluation Standards, local and international webinars to create awareness, like this one we are attending this afternoon, this evening or this morning, wherever you are. Uh, the future of the partnership between OPM and the Uganda Evaluation Association um, is right now in a draft memorandum of understanding, which we put to the Office of the Prime Minister in 2020. And there are other partnerships other than the one we have with OPM. For example, we have a memorandum of understanding with Uganda Management Institute. Uh, we collaborate with GIZ, Uganda Christian University, Uganda Matters University, Utamu, International University of East Africa, and Makere University. So uh, we have those collaborations that are ongoing. Uh, there are other contributions by Uganda Evaluation Association, where we also offer platforms for sharing knowledge on evidence. We have the monthly national evaluation talks. Uh, this one today, for us, we've considered it a monthly national evaluation talk because we had scheduled it on the day when we hold ours, the last Thursday of the month. Uh, of course, it was moved today. And here we share up to date literature and resources, networking among evaluation practitioners and emerging evaluators. Uh, we do quarterly practical trainings uh, uh, where we enhance knowledge and awareness and bridge the gap between theory and practice. Actually, our young and emerging evaluators conduct now monthly trainings. Uh, it is part of the program and they are part of us. So there's a promotion of the young and emerging evaluators, uh, creation of a separate community of the upcoming evaluators to promote inclusiveness, and then establishment of university chapters. Uh, of course, we, we already see that there are areas which we need to strengthen when Mr. Mayanja was presenting and told us about the local government assessments. Uh, we want our members to participate constructively uh, because now they have the, 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 the theoretical part and we want to see them in the practice through those networks. Of course, all the universities have these upcoming people who are training and uh, part of their mentorship, I think they should be participating in all these. Building an evaluation practitioner's database is in progress. We already have uh, uh, a stock of people who have been profiled as members or as evaluators in this country. Of course, later I'll be telling you that we want to see how you benefit from this in the so many evaluations, evidence generation taking place uh, in this country uh, as Office of the Prime Minister. In terms of achievements, lessons, uh, shared goals among members from partner institutions, professional growth and larger membership, that is a public sector at both central and local government, their tangible benefits, capacity enhancement through evaluation week, trainings, and also participating in the different evaluations that the Office of the Prime Minister commissions. There's learning, work opportunities from evaluation consultancies, as uh, Timothy already indicated. Um, a lot of this work is done by consultants. So you are giving our members permanent jobs in ministries, departments, and agencies. Today I've seen most of the people registered. Uh, they are working in different public sector institutions, but also in the private sector, uh, especially on public investments. Communication and networking with wider community of practice and community evaluation, uh, evaluator, evaluators through barazas. Uh, today, uh, we are having one of such where we are seeing clear, we are seeing SEDI, uh, and we are interacting. In terms of bottlenecks, the OU with the Uganda Evaluation Association is still pending for some time so we want to see this signed and, and we saw we continue to collaborate and partner in uh, furthering evaluation in the country nationally there is limited appreciation of evaluation as a profession uh, not the results but as a profession including in government departments uh, the benefits and incentives of belonging to an evaluation association they are not adequately marketed especially by opm through the opportunities such as consultancies and we're already proposing, 
we want you to demand from those people who want to give you the services to be our members. There is inadequate networking locally, popularized evaluation findings, methodologies, and domestication of evaluation standards. Uh, Dr. Guroba said that a lot of work is actually process evaluation. Uh, COVID-19, which has caused the postponement of the evaluation week, and then the budget cuts. Uh, next, moving forward, uh, we think that we should strengthen the partnership with OPM as stipulated in the Memorandum of Understanding. They publicize evaluation profession, evaluation standards, and the association through the terms of reference for jobs, consultancies, and activities. Active and regularly participate in information sharing through the UEA platforms, including the national evaluation talks that are held monthly, capacity building sessions that we conduct quarterly, and the monthly ones which are under the young and emerging evaluators. Adopt use of technology in disseminating evaluation findings, including social media. Provide slots for UEA and the young and emerging evaluate, evaluators in capacity development programs organized by OPM to enhance performance. Review the 2013 public sector m and &E policy, and we pursue the m and &E law which was envisaged in the 2013 policy. And finally, domesticate m and &E CADA cadres across ministry departments and agencies. I, I submit, thank you. Thank you so much, that was right on time. Thank you so much. Um, so I think that gives us maybe two or three minutes actually, just for questions. Um, so we had a few questions coming up in the chat, um, but if there are more, I think that, I think you should put it in the chat and maybe can ask our speakers to answer in the chat itself. But like the two questions that came on, um, which I'd ask any of the our speakers to answer. So one was on what are some of the practical models for assessment of improvements that can be attributed to monitoring and evaluation outcomes? Um, so that was one question. I was wondering uh, one of our speakers could address that. I think it should be one of the commissioners for m and &E, no? How do you assess improvements that are being made um, that can be attributed to monitoring and evaluation outcomes? Okay, uh, thank you, Radhika. Um, since we don't have time, I will spend a half a minute to uh, just respond to a few other things and then maybe attempt to that, uh, which you can also, uh, I, as a moderator, also respond uh, in fact. But um, uh, a couple of comments for which I thank members. Uh, somebody advised that we should use student interns to fill up the capacity gaps. I agree, uh, and we are already doing that, but we will um, uh, intensify that. We have been supervising students from the Uganda Man Man Matters University and Uganda Christian University as well. And um, that is a, an uh, acceptable recommendation. Another member said we should pay them allowances. Well, um, the guidelines and policies do not per se allow us to have payments for interns, but what we do is that we support them uh, to do some field work and to participate in data collection work and so on. So yes, not official, but uh, we do support them. And then uh, Matthias said, uh, UBOS is also doing M&E. The answer is yes. Actually, many institutions also do M&E and contribute to M&E. But uh, the thing is that we work well with them and we quite understand who plays what role uh, in that M&E work. And finally, Robert um, Kauka, who says, um, we need to be more innovative in prioritizing resource allocation under this COVID-19 because it is messed up the planning and budgeting systems, and I agree. So uh, finally, Radhika, uh, so the question is, how do we assess the impact of an m and &E activity? I think that's the question. Uh, so- How do you assess uh, evidence used, no? How do how you assess, assess <laughs> evidence used? How evidence used, million dollar question. Uh, 
Okay. So I think there are many ways um, we can do that. We can do an evaluation of um, a particular program to promote evidence use. Um, and, uh, for example, uh, three years ago, four years ago, we undertook a, a training for directors, only directors and commissioners. We wanted permanent secretaries, but you know how difficult it is. And after that training, we got the message that many of them were so excited about what they are going to do in their respective departments to increase <clears throat> the use of data and evidence. So three years down the road, we did a simple survey just to find out, did you take uh, the message from the training? How did you use it? We asked a few questions and had a number of discussions with them. So we evaluated how they actually took advantage of that training and implemented. And the results were very amazing. Um, but also the findings of the whole overall assessment was very interesting. We discovered many directors are remaining with two to three years of their retirement. So by the time we did the impact, many of them were long after office. Nevertheless, we were still able to establish <coughs> that all those that benefited actually caused one or two or three things in their respective departments to intensify the culture of generating and using evidence. So one method of assessing the use of evidence is actually to do uh, an evaluation uh, to quickly do a rapid review of how that evidence has been used. Um, I will ask uh, my colleagues to, uh, to add on to that. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to add on, any of the speakers? Uh, Radhika, I wanted to add on something. Sure, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, basically, in terms of the impact on the presentation which I made on local government, the performance assessment which we have done for the past four years, we have had very, very big impact on implementation of critical programs in local governments. Because the performance of a local government has implication on the allocation of resources. Most of them struggle to make sure that they improve their procurement system, their financial management, their human resource. And to me, I think that impact is quite progressive and it adds value onto our M1E systems that we do specifically targeting local governments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any of the other speakers want to add in, or chip in with, any, with anything? Okay, maybe not. Uh, I, there was one other question which I don't think we have the time to address because we've um, completely lost uh, on time. It was the question of lack of budget and lack of budget is often cited as a constraint in doing anything. Um, and with COVID-19, lack of budget is, con is going to continue to be a problem. So what are the innovative solutions that we can come up with to address such a constraint? Um, so if anyone has ideas, please feel free to put those on chat right, because we've I think totally ran out of time. Um, just to quickly summarize, it's been a fantastic discussion here. Um, I think many, many achievements have been highlighted. Um, it's been unbelievable what's happened in the, in the last 15 years or so in Uganda. Um, there has been um, the setup of the, you know, the national m &E system, a government evaluation facility, um, and uh, performance improvement plans, and with the, the National Development Plan 3, there's this whole, I think there are lots of avenues for more things to happen in the development of an evaluation agenda, m and &E coordinators for each program area. It's, it's unbelievable the, the number of opportunities. Uh, it's also been great to see the sort of demand for evidence coming from within the government, but also from citizens, from media, from parliament. Um, and what's been particularly encouraging is what's happening also at the local government level, um, independent assessments, um, including parliament conducting self-assessments. Um, so these are all great achievements. 
um, lots of evaluations, impact evaluations, process evaluations, um, research weeks being conducted by parliament, lots of capacity development being done by the Uganda Evaluation Association, platforms being developed, networks being developed. Um, these are fantastic achievements. Um, but there are challenges, of course, and I think being cognizant of the challenges is also a sign that we know where we need to go, right? Um, quality of data, uh, delays in reporting, um, challenges with automation, um, at the local government lack of support from the line MDAs. Um, and I think one of the points that was emphasized by many speakers is this emphasis on reporting, where it is more about reporting, monitoring, um, and as Medina said, the so what question, what happens with follow up? What happens with recommendations? Um, we are making a beginning, but how do we do the follow up? Um, and, and the issue of timeliness, no? So timeliness in uh, figuring out what to evaluate, what to monitor, timeliness in procurement, timeliness in dissemination, um, lots of process evaluations being conducted. How can we be doing other kinds of evaluations? How can we be bringing rigor in evaluation? Um, and so there are challenges. There are lots of achievements that Uganda can be proud of. Um, and um, I think the fact that we can see the challenges, you know, we know where we need to go. So that's just a very quick summary of, of a fantastic discussion. And, and now I'm going to invite Mr. Lubanga. I think we're going to have some closing remarks um, from the Minister for General Duties. Um, the Honorable uh, Justin Lumumba Sule. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Radhika, and um, uh, all the fellow panelists and the participants. Uh, Radhika, I have the honor to introduce um, the representative of the Minister for General Duties in the Office of the Prime Minister, Honorable uh, Justin Kasule Lumumba. Uh, she has sent um, her special assistant, um, Madam Esther Nyakato, who will be uh, making the closing remarks on behalf of the minister. Um, Esther, you are most welcome, and uh, I have the honor and pleasure to invite you to address the participants and to close the, the event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lubanga, Timothy, for this session. Greetings from Uganda, and thank you for all for participating. I'm called Esther Nyakato, a special assistant in the executive team in the office of the prime minister. On behalf of the minister today, the cabinet minister, Honorable Justin Lumumba, she's not here with us, with His Excellency Jori Kaguta Museveni. So she's sorry she's not here today. Your excellencies and honorable ministers, Director Generals and Permanent Secretaries present, donor representatives and development partners, representatives of government and international organizations, the academia and the civil society, the family of evaluation professionals, and stakeholders, ladies and gentlemen. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate you all for, part, for, man, for having managed to participate in this event of the Uganda Monitoring and Evaluation Weekday. Despite of all the ongoing challenges worldwide, the lockdowns and difficulties brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, I urge you all to continue keeping the standard operating procedures in order to fight this pandemic. I have been informed that this event has attracted participants from a number of government ministries departments and agencies, the academia, media, representatives from African countries, and researchers and evaluation networks from around the world. We have also had partner evaluation professionals and researchers participating through the sharing and learning. I'm confident that the event was successful, was a, a successful landmark. The exposure through various presentations and interactive discussions by participants has enriched our views and passion for monitoring and evaluation. In doing this, we have been devotedly committed 
to achieving sustainable results through, among others, continued enhancement of monitoring and evaluation systems, institutionalizing evaluations in government, and incorporating evaluations in management functions for performance improvement. In addition, as you may have learned through the event today, we are establishing various monitoring and evaluation systems and tools for the next five years, such as web-based monitoring and evaluation system for the National Development Plan, NDP, the introduction of M and E specialists in the 20 program secretaries for 20 programs of NDP3, review of the national monitoring and evaluation policy, and development of a new national evaluation agenda. In Uganda, working with our partners, we are in initial stages of development of our oil and gas industry. This sector needs a lot of investment, including developing a robust monitoring and evaluation framework for which we would benefit from the experience and expertise built in other countries. I'm well convinced that the discussions and experiences which participants have shared were exhaustive given the diversity of approaches and experiences shared. We in the office of the prime minister have taken note of the comments and recommendations and will ensure that we make, the, we make use of them for the betterment of our work and performance management across the public sector. On behalf of the Office of the Prime Minister, I would like to convey my special thanks to the following. The Twendembele Management Committee, the Program Secretariat, the CLEAR AA for supporting us through organizing this event, the partners from the Economic Policy Research Center, the Strengthening Evidence Use of Development Impact, SEDI Consortium, the Economic Policy Research Center, EPRC, Uganda Evaluations Association, UEA, and the Parliamentary Commission, as well as the organizing team. All of you who have, ma who have managed to find time to participate in this event. We thank you. I now have the honor to close the Uganda Evaluation Day 2021 for God and my country. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those uh, motivational words. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Um, and for the continued uh, commitment uh, to evidence-informed decision making. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, we. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I think that's all that we have time for. Uh, we've been slightly over. We've gone over by ten minutes, um, but I think it's been a fantastic discussion. But I know that we will continue these conversations through Twendembele. Um, anyone else wants to say thanks? I can see uh, <laughs> Mr. Lamaka. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you again, everyone. Um, see you next time at the next Friend Emily webinar. Thank right. you, too. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye bye.